Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please as we go through the following safety instructions. In the event that there is a loss of cabin pressure, oxygen mask will drop from the overhead. Place the mask over your nose and mouth. Breathe normally as oxygen is flowing even if the mask is not in Evil laugh, evil life, evil laugh. You know, one day I'm just going to be. Mwah. <laughs> <laughs> hello, 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 everyone. This is the Holiloquy podcast where we step out and talk about sexuality. It's your favorite host, Vernon T. Scott, also known as Slater Jackson. Look, I got it right that time. Also known as Sebastian Zadams. Uh, for those who found me on that end of the spectrum, um, welcome, welcome, welcome. On today's episode, we will be talking about preferences, and the guest is the beautiful and wonderful Tyrell. So just for those individuals who have who missed the last episode and might need that refresher, who are you? Hello, hello, everybody. My name is Tyrell Collins. I'm 28 from Atlanta, Georgia. I am a second year doctoral student at Georgia State University, and I am so happy to be here. Y'all heard that he said he is educated, y'all. He is <laughs> educated. <laughs> we love to see it. And you said this is your second year. Um, how is that journey going? It's going by uh, really fast. Um, actually, I am getting ready to take a major exam for my uh, in my program uh, that pretty much is like a defense for what I want to do for my dissertation topic. And the fact that like it's now, <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's not like in a few months, like it's now, mm-hmm. like so. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely moving by at a you know rapid pace, but it's also a good thing. Um, because, you know, like, nobody's wanting you to slow down, you know, like, people are there to support you that want you to take your time, do it at your own pace. But at the same time, you know, when people trying to charge you student fees and stuff like that, it's like, I need to get the hell on. So, you know, it's like, yeah, let's get this process moving. (laughs) Yes, yes, I understand that feeling way too well. Uh, And with that solidarity. Uh, I might as well go ahead and put that title on it. Dr. Collins is happening because it is what it is. Look, I think it was my, um, I think it was probably not last year, 2020, late 2020. Um, my classmates at that point, we just started calling each other doctor at, wow. at that point because we're just like, you know what? Even though these people are fucking around with those fuck rounds and, and yeah. pissing us off, we're doing this for ourselves. We're doing that for those who we love. We're going to go ahead and start to calling ourselves doctors. So it's already yeah. normal by the time it actually hits. <laughs> Y'all better live in that embodiment. Part of my dissertation work is speaking about embodiment and you better live in the embodiment of however you feel a doctor should be treated. Amen. Amen to that. So, uh, as I mentioned, we will be talking about preferences today. So uh, one of the things that we talked about within our intake meeting is just how our, our preferences tend to fluctuate over time. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, what, what is your perspective on that? And as well as how has your um, personal preferences fluctuated throughout the years? Right. Well, I think that um, I think something that I see um you know, pretty often in like online forums and, you know, things like that is how we get into, which is another conversation for another time is, you know, this whole aspect of people thinking that they're putting their preferences up by excluding other groups of people with the whole no fat, no femme, you know, and just, you know, all of this body shaming and, you know, things like that. And, you know, people will have a defense about the fact, oh, that's just my preference. Mm-hmm. You know, but I, I often always feel it, it seems to feel like when people are trying to explain what their preferences are, it almost feels like a dig or a stab to everyone else. And I've often always said, you know, if you're not necessarily into, you know, bigger people or, you know, more voluptuous people or, you know, a certain ethnicity of people, 
there's no reason why you need to necessarily advertise that. Like, just move about with whoever it is that you know you're seeking. Like, I, I just feel like sometimes we can be, you know, there's a time and a place for everything. And sometimes I think the nature of social media and being online just, you know, it allows us to have open access permission to just say whatever we want to, you know, mm -hmm. regardless of how it makes other people feel. And, you know, I, I think that people get into this aspect Well, I'm just trying to keep it real, but it's like, well, nobody asks for your, asks for your opinion anyway. Mm -hmm. So, and when you're trying to state what your preferences are, you know, when you're, <clears throat> ultimately excluding all of these groups and sections of people and it especially I think it especially annoys me for a lot of people who are you know they're looking for you know long lasting or committed relationships and they just have this entire grocery or tier list for everything that they want and everything that they don't want and I'm like well unless you're gonna go to build a bear and build you somebody <laughs> you know it's like why do you feel a need to you know, exclude all of these other groups of people. By you doing that, you never know. Your exclusion, you could be passing up the love of your life and you wouldn't even know because you have this idea in your mind about uh, about a preference. And that's another thing I have about preferences. People really don't understand what preference actually means. Preference is mm. not to exclude. Preference is, oh, I prefer this or my gravitation is to this, but it doesn't mean that I don't like that. Amen to that. Yeah. Um, like uh, for those who have not purchased the Central Bout on how to be a host, purchase that. And this, um, the analogy that I use there, it is, uh, oh, by the way, that link will be in the show notes. But, <laughs> but in there, I um, make the analogy that your preferences are just like like if you have a favorite ice cream, yeah, mm. you want vanilla or, um, but you're not going to be extremely mad if um, you're, you, you're served chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream or sherbet or whatever type of other ice cream is out there because you you're open to those varieties of the ice cream. You're not going to flip a table because someone was like, oh, you know what? Here's a Sunday. It still has vanilla, but we just threw a banana on there because I know that you like bananas sometimes. You're not going to get upset. You still are getting your preference. You're still getting something that you admire, but that doesn't close that door on anything else. You're not going to walk into an ice cream shop saying, I do not fuck with anything that is Rocky Road. Do not give me Rocky Road or else I'm going to fight you. It, no, you're just going to say, hey, I prefer vanilla. If you don't have it, okay, what else do you have? Do you have a vanilla adjacent? Do you have a soft serve ice cream? Do you have something that's vegan? Do you have this? You have options that still kind of tastes like vanilla. <laughs> like, exactly. Like, it, it, it's not as deep as a lot of people try to make it to be. Uh, and they're focusing more on their the things that they discriminate against or, um, or their ideal deal breakers rather than what they are actually preferring. And, you know, and I think a lot of times preferences, well, what people tend to call preferences, it comes down to, you know, you've had a bad experience, mm -hmm. you know, with this. And so now it's, it's turned you off a, a a candid conversation, which can be a whole nother conversation in itself, is people, you know, who date outside of their ethnicity and their background. And I, I remember I was seeing this YouTube video one time where this group of college students, where they were talking one time, and they were talking about their preferential, you know, pre uh, preferences in dating. And you had a lot of, um, a lot of those men and women who were coming from very different aspects and perspective, not just from an ethnic, you know, standpoint, but just of environment standpoint, uh, culture standpoint, gender standpoint. You had a lot of, you know, of the guys and a lot of the women to say that because of the fact that they grew up in a kind of racially diverse, you know, communities, they didn't necessarily have a preference, you know, mm -hmm. for dating experiences, regardless of ethnic background or, you know, anything like that. And then you had, a, you know, some people who are a part of that conversation was like, well, no, you know, if I was raised predominantly, you know, in a black or brown, you know, setting, environment does shape attraction. Like that yes. is what I am attracted to. And some people, they will say that, hey, you know, those past family things, like I would not dare bring somebody of another 
culture, another background into, you know, my family. And even though obviously we're being more progressive, times are changing and things like that, we still have a lot of deep seated things that are in us that shape our preferences. Mm-hmm. Like um, this is a conversation I had with my stepmom once where uh, we were looking at uh, it was I think it was a meme or probably something on TikTok where mm-hmm. it was like fill in the blank and it was like uh, <laughs> Will of Fortune style. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I solved it because it, it pretty much was saying if they can't use your comb, if they can't use your comb, don't bring them home. Bring and them home. she was like. I don't get that. What does that mean? Now, my stepmom, she's Black, um, been raised around Black people most of her life, but um, she also comes, she has some white individuals who are within her family too. Mm -hmm. So she was really um, perplexed by what the hell does that really mean? And I'm like, well, think about it this way. Whenever you, because my brother, he he actually prefers white women, which, Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, think about your son, right? his girlfriend, how smoothly does the hair, uh, how smoothly does the comb go through her hair? And she was like, oh, real easy. Well, what about yourself? How um, smooth does it go through your hair? She was like, well, you know, take, you know, take some time. And I was like, that's what it means. She's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I also feel like with preferences, a lot of times when people are put into positions where they have chosen, they have chosen something or someone that is outside of, um, the norm or something mm-hmm. that goes against the grain, you're always put in positions where you fit, where you have to justify your preference. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times that says a lot about how you actually feel, because when we talk about dating or talk about love, love is love. You love whoever you love, regard you, that could be black, white, pink or purple, you know, and it's kind of like, you love who you love. You shouldn't be uh, feeling like you have to defend that. But if something is arising in you anytime you have a conversation with uh, a particular ethnicity or culture or group of people where you feel like you have to defend yourself all the time, that, I say examine that and analyze that. Like, why, mm-hmm. why is it do you feel like your preference for someone, you know, you feel a justification to have to defend? Because a lot of times... People, I think people tend to have more respect for you when you are not trying to defend your choices. Mm-hmm. You, you know, know, living your truth. So even though it's because people may not like your choices, they they don't have to like it. There is not their life. But it seems that, you know, a lot of times that I have witnessed it, like people will be put in situations where, you know, they feel like they really do have to defend or justify why they like a like why they like a certain person or why they have a preference for this. And I'm like, if it's truly a preference, you don't need to justify or defend anything to anyone. Mm-hmm. Just live in your truth and accept Just live in your truth, yeah. And that, that kind of brings me up on the um, situation that we were talking about before the show with um, the thing that happened in Florida um, recently, like yesterday, where um, the young lady, uh, she was a white woman who... Um, stabbed her boyfriend who's a black man uh, Mm -hmm. multiple times if i'm not mistaken and he resulting in his death and because of that i noticed on social media how there are people under his comments uh his ig pulling up things on twitter pretty much talking about how he uh, was uh, degrading black women which we both can agree that uh is not okay is not appropriate but this is a person who was murdered. Why are we looking at his past history with the great and black women, not the fact that he was just murdered? The Holiloquy podcast focuses on the variability of sexual expression. When it comes to sexual expression, we often depend on pornography to illustrate how one must perform sexually. For those who have not learned this by now, the stuff you see in porn is not real. Pornography provides a singular perspective of sexual expression that is not often the reality we see during our own sexual encounters. The Holiloquy Podcast is a conversation that takes you outside of the compressed box of what many know about sex. Some of the topics we discuss include kinks, condom usage, status disclosure, and past sexual experiences. The Holiloquy Podcast steps out on sexual norms and recognizes that the norm is not the only normal. Subscribe today and join the conversation. 
this is a person who was murdered. Why are we looking at his past history with the great and black women, not the fact that he was just murdered? Right. You know, I, I think that, like we say, how do we jump from one to the other is big be, me. So, you know, one does not have to do with the other in the least bit sense. Mm. Um, I think that, again, as we talk about justification, I think that the people who are making those, you know, kind of absurd comments, you know, under under his picture and under his post, you know, I think maybe they're having the mentality that, you know, because of the fact that he was degrading uh, Black women that, oh, isn't it this like cosmic justice, like you get stabbed by a white woman. Mm -hmm. And so I think it goes back to that um, sense of ownership and, you know, kind of quote unquote protection as to say like, oh, if he was with a black woman, that wouldn't have that, you know, like that wouldn't have happened as, you know, I kind of like absurd as that is. I think that, you know, there's there's always a method to, uh, you know, madness, you know, when they when people, you know, make absurd, you know, absurd comments, you know, such as that. And again, one not having to do anything with the other. Right. Like you say that this is a man at the end of the day who lost his life. Mm -hmm. you know? And you got people saying that he deserved to have died yeah. solely because he was dating a white woman. Like as, as though dating a white woman is equ equates to being uh, murdered or, uh, murdered, right. um, or just being disrespectful towards black women is... Uh, a caveat to being murdered if that was the case why yeah. the hell do we still have so many white people out here because of this much disrespect they've um placed on black women um and even speaking for our own and even speaking for our own black and brown people who yes consistently degrade you know degrade you, you know our own kind so it's um yeah so it's just it's just really absurd right like a person's preference is not a reason to be murdered and be murdered, right? and there's so much of that that has happened within a lot of most definitely heterosexual spaces where you might have a black man dating a white woman and the white father is upset and murders that black man mm -hmm. because he does not want to see his um daughter with the black man and that history of that alone wow. and i'm like let's not <laughs> let's not yeah um now um i i guess this can transition over to an uh, a, a topic that um we did discuss which is um having room for redemption and forgiveness um granted this for that person is more on the justice side rather than you know where we're leading in this conversation but um do you believe that when it does come to certain people who uh, have these deal breakers that are unreasonable? Um, is it right to have that room for them to redeem themselves or even provide forgiveness to them? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that depending on what it is that you particularly value in life, you know, it it's, um, you know, I, I think I'm reminded of when it was said that, you know, forgiveness is hard for many people because mm -hmm. when you're done wrong, you hold yourself in this false sense of blamelessness when even when you are right in this situation, you weren't always blameless in every situation. Mm. You know, so I think that when we, that's why I think we have, we, we struggle with this notion of forgiveness because it's kind of like if somebody has done something uh once okay yeah we may brush it off but if it's something that is repeatedly done it's something that consistently hurts me what capacity do I have to forgive and that's I think that's why we have the saying you know I forgive but I never forget mm. you know and when people see you know when it's in the you know in the testament about saying that you know forgiveness is you know not for the other person it's for you it truly is because you are the one that's having to carry around whatever it is that, you know, uh, got brought up in those feelings and in that situation. And so um, I think that forgiveness is a process over time mm -hmm. and it forgiveness has to be a, a kind of warm feeling, not to say that it needs to be a fuzzy feeling, but it needs to be a warm feeling that you're getting that, hey, you could have decided to come to some sort of resolution with this person, or you have decided that, hey, you know, we need to part ways for, you know, whatever reason. And knowing from the other end, 
just because somebody hasn't chosen to forgive you does not mean that they hate you. Mm. You know, for non-forgiveness does not mean hate. And I think people take offense when, you know, like when we don't, um, when not having like a title in your life, you know, but it's like to say, okay, what am I to you now? You know, if, if we're having a falling out as a friend, um, you know, is it in your capacity to, for, you know, to forgive? I can't automatically assume just because you choose not to forgive me that all of a sudden now that you hate me, you mm-hmm. just may not be in that place and may never be in that place to forgive, but to kind of jump to, you know, that connotation. But then I think that's when people go down that rabbit hole. It's kind of like, oh, well, if you don't forgive me, then like, what, what am I to you now? You know, am I still a friend? Am I just somebody, you know, an acquaintance that you pass by? And that's really up to, you know, that, that person, you know, to, to decide. And so, yeah, I, I think that forgiveness is, is definitely a process that, that happens over time. And you can't rush anybody's process. You have to give them just due time for them to uh, reconcile or, you know, come to some sort of amends for whatever it is that has, you know, transpired and see about how you can, you know, move forward for that. That's in a healthy and positive way for all parties involved. Amen to that. Like um, the most, like how you started off, um, you can forgive and not forget. Uh, And I think that is a concept that a lot of people, because, you know, we are taught to uh, forget, uh, forget, forgive and all the other stuff, but it, there's a way for you, like, let's say if someone cheated on you, mm-hmm. you can forgive that person. And the forgiveness of that person is not to say that, oh, you know what? You said, you're sorry. I forgive you. And then every three months, bring, throw it in their face that you cheated yeah. on me. You cheated on me. You never forgave that person. Exactly. You said the words, but you didn't really forgive them. Mm-hmm. Now this, if you truly forgave them, there's no need to throw that in their face because that issue has been resolved, but that doesn't mean that you have to forget. Mm-hmm. That just means, okay, this happened. If this happens again, then you have that decision to make that if you want to continue, you can forgive a second time or you can just let it go. You yeah. see that there's a pattern within that relationship that you just don't accept anymore. And that's fine. That's perfectly fine for you to let that go. Exactly. Uh, it's just based off of what I remember, based off of the actions that you've shown me, you're not willing to change for me. You're not willing to be that partner that I want. So I'm going to let that go. Exactly. You're forgiven. It is what it is, but you're blocking me from my path. You're blocking me for what I want in my life. Right. And I think that when you, when you're, when, I think when people are establishing, you know, whether or not they can forgive some, you know, forgive something or someone, it's about, you know, how do you feel about the fact that your boundaries have been crossed, Mm -hmm. you know, and you may be having feelings of being disrespected humiliated, embarrassed, you know, all of those kind of confounding feelings. And I, I, I've always been of the mindset, I think people can do the work to try to work through anything. However, it doesn't always translate to the fact that, oh, we should still be together. Mm. You know, we can work to heal what's been, you, we can work to heal what's been done, but that may not necessarily mean that at the end of this, we are still together. You know, and so, you know, as they say, you know, tr- and as we talk about trust and forgiveness, it's kind of like trust is something that takes a long time to build and only seconds to destroy. Mm. And so when you think about forgiveness, you know, I think to really think about what your heart has the capacity for, because like I said, you know, to hold someone accountable to a certain degree, yes, but to also recognize about the fact that you have never been blamed. You you have been in situations more than likely where you were you are not held completely blameless for something. Hmm. So it's kind of like take a mirror, look back at yourself, and it's not to say that what somebody has done is a justification for anything, but also try to understand something from there from another perspective. Because, like you say, for the example of cheating, cheating rarely has to do with the person itself. It's always because of something that is missing, something that is going on outside of, you know, the relationship or, you know, anything like that. Rarely does it have to do with you as a person, Mm -hmm. you know? So, mm -hmm. 
Now, this, this is more on the redemption side, and I'm thinking about where we are on a societal level, most definitely when it comes to like politics in a way, where you have a lot of propaganda that is being fed into people and how a lot of people have been radicalized within the last few years, mm -hmm. um, be it um, not necessarily just Trump supporters, but those people who are followers of QAnon, those people who um, become became anti-vaxxers, the ones that we even have in our families who are also worthy of redemption. And I'm thinking about how we like even within our daily lives with our the people that we're interested in is are we in a place to give that grace to those individuals so that they can begin their levels in processes of redemption exactly and i that's a, such a great point because again i think it's about assessing what you have the capacity to deal with, you know, as far as your values. Like there was a couple on television, you know, they talked about just recently how they make their marriage work with the fact that um, this woman, her husband's a Republican, her, um, and she's, you know, on the Democratic, you know, side. And, you know, so everybody wants to know, okay, so what are those conversation dinners, you know, kind of <laughs> look like? Um, and like she says, you know, when you're talking like specifically about politics, you know, you may want the same thing, you know, like you essentially want the same thing for society and for people. You just have two different, you know, notions of getting there. But I think that when we come into, again, it's about what we place value in. Mm -hmm. To a lot of people, it's important that a partner has my same uh, political values you know, and things like that. Some people, they could, you know, you know, it's not to say that they could care less, but they may be open to mm -hmm. someone having another, you know, kind of political view or, you know, kind of outlook or, you know, something like that. So again, I think it really comes down to what it is that you can actually live with. So that way, when you do have those moments of contention and you talk about forgiveness and talk about redemption, it's kind of like to say, okay, let's go back to the foundation. Mm -hmm. You already knew this you know, when you met this person or you found out this about this person. So knowing like, let's not be naive here. There's going to come a point where you're going to come into some sort of contention with each other mm -hmm. or views with each other. How you handle that proves the success of what's going to, what actually is going to transpire after. Right. And I think even with, when at those moments of contention, that is that point where you have to have that conversation uh, with your partner as well as with yourself to figure out is this person who I am with today in this moment not even th uh, thinking about the person that they were in the past it's just who they present themselves as today mm -hmm. is this the person that I want to continue to agree to be in love with mm -hmm. and if not am I ready for that grieving process or do I need some time to transition into that phase. And that's a conversation that uh, I think a lot of people don't be uh, having is where are we today? And who are you? And do I accept you for who you are? And if not, what's going to be your next steps? Exactly. And, and yeah, it is something about, you know, as you love being a, you know, conscious choice, you know, whenever you are with someone, or with um, partners or even just anything in general, you know, you make a conscious choice to be with someone, mm -hmm. you know? So um, I love how, you know, it's, it's said about, I like how people, you know, you don't fall in love. Love is not something that, you know, is like a light switch or something that you just automatically fall into. You grow in love with a person. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to different viewpoints or value viewpoints, um, again, it's like to say, we may have very differing views on, this particular issue, but ultimately we want the same thing. And, you know, I can kind of consider that kind of, kind of connote about this like classic, you know, conversation about do opposites attract. And I've always been of the mindset that, no, I don't believe that two very opposite people attract. We can be on, we can have different shades of the same color and on that spectrum. It's kind mm -hmm. of like, no, if I'm orange and, you know, you're, uh, purple or, you know, something like that being two very different opposites. No, I don't, you know, believe that that can work. However, if I am light blue and you're dark blue, we're on different spectrums, but we're still, on, we're still in the same shade of blue, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, I, I, but like I say, again, I think it really just comes down to what it really is that you value. If you really believe that 
you need a partner who does value um, the kind of outlook that you have, then you need to be upfront with that mm-hmm. before you get in take before you get entwined and invested into somebody that is not going to have that. And those kind of things, I really feel like you can tell really early on. I agree. Um, most definitely these days, um, a lot more people are open about who they are and going back to Maya, <laughs> when someone yeah. shows you who you, who they are exactly. the first time, believe them. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Now, um, so, uh, we were talking about socio emotional intelligence in the lack thereof <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> where we are in society and, uh, cultures today. So, uh, provide us all with your perspective on that. Yes. Yeah, so I really feel like in getting to know people, it's really important to assess what we like to call a socio-emotional intelligence. And depending on it, just like any term, it has varying vocab, it has varying definitions. To me, what I think a uh, socio-emotional vocab, uh, outlook and perspective is, is that someone who is able to articulate and address their feelings in a non-oppressive and non-combative way. Mm. So it is to say that I think just to put this into context, a lot of times this is a struggle area for self-identifying men, where if we're hurt by something, we won't say that we're hurt. We'll say that, oh, like I'm angry about, you know, I'm angry about that. Or why did somebody do, you know, why would somebody do that? Or, you know, just have all of these things. And what is really going on is like, no, I'm not really angry about what just happened. Like that, what that just happened, that hurt me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so a lot of times when we're talking about socio-emotional intelligence, we're talking about being able to effectively identify different emotions that arise. And it's not to say like, you always need to be um, on, you know, or, you know, that that's going to come 100% of the time. A lot of times we don't know that we feel something until something happens that el- elicits that kind of response. But it's to say when you're getting to know someone and it's kind of like they just have like this one kind of flat note as to how they're feeling all the time. Mm. Not going to say that that's, you know, something that may be um, mental or physical that's going on. But it is to say if they can't articulate this uh an emotional vocabulary about how it is that they're feeling or what they actually feel about something, then that can be considered to be like a red flag. Because it's to say, if you're going to potentially grow with this person, you need to know, well, how does that look for them? You know, what words do they place onto that? And it's something that, uh, it was actually a a pretty interesting article I read. Um, They were saying, in getting to know people, ask them a question and then like, if it's like so many dates later or it's days later that you talk with the person, ask them the same question to see if they give you the same answer. Hmm. And it, and the reason for that is to not just to see if they give you the same answer, but to see has have their feelings regarding uh, something changed. So as we talk about doing check-ins with people, to have some of the same recursive conversations, you hmm. know, to see if somebody's uh, socio-emotional you know, kind of intelligence or vocabulary is being elevated because it is something that also has to be learned as well. Uh, And um, this is just to put um, this into context um, for certain individuals who might be asking, okay, why ask the same question? Think about if you were to be watching a TV show. It's your favorite show. And the first time you watched it, you loved it. Uh, Everything uh, you understood. And then let's say, before that that same show you watched that before you ever experienced heartbreak and then when you rewatch that show and you see it from a different perspective Mm -hmm. that's essentially what's going on when you ask somebody a different question at a different stage in their life to see exactly how their perspective may have changed throughout that time frame if there's any emotional response within that um, that's why that's that's essentially what's going on here. And even just to put it very plainly, like just like just even to take this example, a good part of having socio emotional intelligence is understanding how a prospective partner 
manages their emotions. You know, so a lot of times you will have people that will say, I like to be, I like to go out in certain places with this, you know, with a prospective partner or have somebody to meet me in a particular space because I want to see how they manage or they handle, uh, handle something. You know, if you're with a potential partner, there is going to come a time where you're going to want to see how they handle a conflict that arises if you're mm-hmm. out in public with them. Are they going to fly off the handle? Or are they going to want to uh, fight? Or are they going to want to walk away? You know, the um, uh, fight versus flight response or, you know, so, so just even seeing people in different environments and how they actually manage their emotions in different environments um, is a key part to uh, that socio-emotional intelligence. And only you can decide, obviously, what is important to you in mm-hmm. about handling, you know, those kind of aspects. But Yeah, just figuring out, again, how you actually manage emotions as well. And this is why I'm a huge supporter of uh, mostly when it comes to me dating someone, because I'm very intentional when it comes to dating. Casual hookups, it's kind of like, okay, it's whatever. It it is what it is. You know why you're fucking here. (laughs) (laughs) But when it comes to dating, I'm very intentional in uh, a part of that intentionality is knowing someone who's been to therapy or uh, or practice some kind of self-reflection so that they understand where they are, what they feel, what their triggers are, and how their past traumas affect them today. Because mm-hmm. if you're going, if you're in conflict with somebody and you know that this individual um, doesn't like yelling, then sure. that's going to be something that you have to be cognizant of because that yelling might trigger an emotional response exactly. that might bring even more negativity in your life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if that's something that you're not aware of and you just experience that in the moment, then you're just left like, okay, do they love me anymore? Do they hate me? Like, where did this come from? I didn't even say something that I thought that was that bad. Like, right. even if you're calling somebody, most definitely because we, you know, we live in a, society that doesn't encourage men to feel their emotions mm-hmm. or even um, focuses on so much in, of our masculinity that something so simple can masculate us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how if you call certain individuals, oh, you're just a little bitch, how that can actually evoke that person to hit you, uh, even though, because that pr- brought them back to a space in their childhood where that word was used that triggered a response that this response now becomes violent Mm -hmm. and this is not to say that you know this is how domestic violence situations happen that's not what i'm saying at all but this is how some emotional responses actually play themselves out Uh, most definitely there's a person who is who has a a avoidance response and they're wanting to leave the situation go away hide find shelter find some kind of comfort and you're pursuing them and their back becomes against the wall and they're overwhelmed and that now they're in a flight uh, fight or flight response where they're just like i'm i need to eliminate this stressor this trigger right right now and they hit you that happens exactly and something that uh because i'm a major fan of the show uh put a ring on it with uh dr um uh nicola beach and uh to me she's like i don't like to compare people but it's kind of like she has taken over like that Iana Van Zandt, you know, kind of mm-hmm. energy and spirit. And one of the more recent episodes she had with um this couple, because the nature of the show is to say like, okay, all these couples are in a uh in a at an impasse. They are refusing to go forward, but they don't want to go backwards. So it's time to really say, are we gonna get married? Or are we going to go on separate ways? So that's the whole premise of the show, if you're if you're not mm-hmm. familiar. But something that she had a conversation about recently was there was the couple, a uh, man and woman, and the way that their argument happened the day before, she felt really disrespected by the things that he was that he was saying. And what Dr. LaBeach got him to recognize as a part of, you know, emotional intelligence, even though what he said, he did not mean, you know, the way that she took it. However, she said that as a man, can you take responsibility and accountability for how it made her feel? Mm. And I thought that that was a very uh, interesting aspect because what 
what tends to get people in trouble, I think a lot of times with relationships is that even if somebody has a little, you know, of a lesser emotional intelligence or, you know, something along those lines, or even for people who have considered themselves to have a high emotional intelligence, um, it doesn't mean that just because they understand your perspective that um, they won't diminish your experience. Mm. Classic case of, oh, um, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but like there is no there is no but to it. You know, this is how this made me feel. So if you're dealing with I to me, I think if you're dealing with someone who is in that space with you, you're trying to express how, you know, this happened in this tra- this transpired and how this made you feel and that person says, "Yeah, I get what you're saying, but" you know, they're not really taking your feelings into accountability. They're just trying to uh, get over whatever it is that, you know, Mm -hmm. has, has happened. And so to me in that example, when she asked about the fact that, yeah, you did not mean this mean for what you said to come out the way that it did, but because of the fact it made your, your, you know, your, your girlfriend feel, you know, away. And that's how she took it. Can you take responsibility and accountability for how it made her feel? Right. And the fact that he was able to do that, they were actually able to have a, you know, conversation where, you know, apologies were met and, you know, they were able to, you know, move on, you know, from that. But that's what having that socio-emotional intelligence requires. It requires you to manage your emotions, but to also recognize that when you have modes of communication that do not sit well with a, you know, perspective, with a potential partner or, you know, a current partner or what have you, you have to take, you know, some type of ownership in that. Mm-hmm. It may not be what you have, it, you know, intended it to be, but if that is the way that they they took it, take responsibility for that and make an effort to do something, to do something better. Because as she also said, there's a difference between showing up on the mat, on the mat, and there's a difference between showing up at the table. When you show up on the mat, you're looking to fight where somebody is going to win, somebody is going to lose. And when you're in a partnership, nobody wins or loses if you're both in contention. Mm -hmm. When you show up at the table, this is where everyone's feelings are being respected. Everything is being put on, actually being put on the table. And we're looking to how do we actually, you know, how do we coexist and make this work for us? Mm. That sounds like a show I probably do need to start watching because like <clears throat> those are the conversations that has been like l- looking at things on a societal level and just mm-hmm. how um, certain shows are advertised to us. Yeah. That's something that has been extremely missing. Like I'm so happy Mari is like fucking canceled. I, I, I'm right. so happy because first and foremost, because a lot of people don't read the little no, disclaimers, uh, some of those test results that he provided Ooh. to people were fake. They were false. Don't Ooh. really know if this is the father or not. We're just going to say it isn't because we can. We want to provoke, uh, provoke an emotional response that, you know, this person feels triggered and they want to escape. Like whoever curated that show, they found the right people um, for all of that. But to help people see exactly where your emotions are coming from, what, uh, how you felt in that moment and how those words impact your partner and how your partner's words impact you. That is a lot more dedicated towards personal growth, understanding who you are and even those who are watching it to understand how they might display certain things in their daily lives which is beneficial to society rather than a detriment. Uh, Because when we do watch TV shows, we look at those, uh, most definitely for those who do not have, um, let's say past, uh, well, the the capacity to critically think, let's put it that way. Um, They tend to fall into certain scripts that is advertised to them because this is what the normal is supposed to be. Therefore, let me make this my reality. Let me make this my normal and let me behave in that manner because that is what they're showing me is how I'm supposed to live my life. Right. Uh, and-, and I do feel that for you know people who do consider themselves to have a good, uh, to have good socio-emotional intelligence, um, you also have to 
be aware of checking yourself as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you may be dealing with someone that, no, they may not be at a place of communicating with you the way that you need to, but that's where the work of a, you know, a, a relationship comes from. And so there is not to say that somebody who may have a little bit less of socio-emotional intelligence, that they can't get there you know, or get to the place that, you know, you maybe would like them to be. But it's also about, okay, if I'm telling you this, and I'm telling you like, this is a boundary, or, you know, I consider this to be this or what have you, if they are making the conscious effort to respect that and do the work, hey, that's what it's, that's what it's all about, you know, so I think sometimes when people go into situations and they consider themselves to have a good socio-emotional intelligence, they just automatically assume that that's the way that their partner needs to be mm. and not recognizing that that's where the work comes in. And uh, I think about, uh, this is a friend's relationship and how her and her partner, um, I think she's in their household. Well, I think they both have some form of a mental uh illness that they deal with but uh she was vocal about something that she experienced from him where whenever he knows that she's feeling depressed how he gives her the time to be depressed uh, make sure that um, the things that she likes is available to her um, that she is comfortable in those times when she's feeling down because that is what a partnership looks like they know what your downside looks like and they know what can bring you out of your depression and a lot of that comes through knowing yourself knowing who you are knowing what triggers you and um, your partner understanding that because you've communicated that with them uh, and that's something that when let's throw back to the preferences and deal breakers that's something that you probably should um Think about when it comes to you engaging with people in the dating process of whenever I'm not feeling my best, is this person that I'm spending time with willing to be there for me? That's what it means when um, whoever your uh, officiate of your wedding, if you have that, or whatever kind of partnership you're engaging with, that's what they often mean when they say uh, we be there through sickness and health. Sickness forms mm -hmm. in different forms it can be mental health it can be uh it can be physical health it can be anything are you willing to be there to make sure that they still feel the same quality of love when they're not at their best yes absolutely yeah and i think that you know when it um there's a um there's a song by i believe her name is uh kayla brianna um she has a song called details and uh, the nature of the song is, you know, she's explaining that um, why she loves her boyfriend so much is because it's all in the details that he noticed. Uh, he knows when, uh, how to handle her when she has an attitude. Mm -hmm. You know, he knows what to do in her times of sadness, in her moments of joy. And uh, it's a really, you know, like really, you know, chill vibe now song. So definitely uh, promoting, uh, definitely promoting her if you haven't uh, heard <laughs> But, um, but yeah, knowing how to manage your partner in different situations, because, um, you know, just like how we talk about the love languages, which um, is another topic that I don't really promote, um, that, um, uh, that, you know, you have to be, have to learn to be in tune with what it is that your partner needs. You may, you can't subscribe what you believe that they need in this moment. You have to ask if they need space give them some space. Mm -hmm. You know, if they, if they need this from you, try your best to, you know, facilitate that and give them that. Um, you know, so it, again, like I say, it's all in the details. Yes. Details. Um, so I was, uh, this is leading going towards the uh, last topic of discussion, which is, um, I, I wrote a blog about this. This is my favorite topic. Uh, it's essentially wants and needs, identifying your wants and needs. Uh, for me, wants is all about those desires, um, things that is fantastic, you can go with, go without, and needs are those things that are the necessities within like a relationship or within your personal spaces. You need water to survive. You don't want water to survive. You can right. want water every now and again, you can want a soda, you can want this, that, and the third, but you still need water to survive. So um, that's how I typically look at wants and needs. But uh, what's your view of it and how does that uh, correlate to preferences uh, in a way. 
yeah, I think that uh, wants and needs uh, get, you know, tacked onto the, the, those things about what are um, negotiable and non-negotiable things, you know, about your, about your life. Um, like I know, particularly for me, um, the one thing I just will not accept, you know, will not accept is um, any type of physical, you know, physical and emotional abuse, you know, in a mm-hmm. relationship. I'm just like, you have one time to put your hands on me and it's over. <laughs> like, that's just, mm-hmm. it's, it's, there is no talking about it. There is no conversation that needs to be had. It's over, you know? So, and I know that that's like an extreme case, but it is to say that when you talk about, you know, wants, like, uh, like I say, going back to the nature of uh, like when people create their list of things like they would want in a partner, you know, you could want someone um, who is six feet tall, right? But again, as we've had in a previous conversation about preferences, oh, do I prefer someone that's six feet tall? Sure. But does that mean that I'm just going to dismiss somebody who's five, six, five, seven? No. You know, so just because this may be a want doesn't mean like it's a non-negotiable. Mm-hmm. You know, so and then, like we say, when we're talking about needs, this is, uh, I think, for the nature of a relationship, your needs always come down to what are those value um, aspects that you know have to happen with a relationship. For those that may be uh, into, because it's a very popular show on Netflix, uh, the show Love Is Blind, yes. that became a very contentious aspect of one of the couples. How she thought in her head she could compromise with this this you know partner that she wanted to spend her life with about him not being uh religious Mm -hmm. and you know she thought you know for whatever reason she could you know compromise with it in her head and at the end of the day she really couldn't Mm -hmm. you know and it's not because she I think she thought any sort of negative way towards him but knowing that faith and the the faith values are something that is essential to her life and as a part of her family's life, she couldn't go through with it. I agree. You know, so essentially, that was not a want for her. She did not necessarily uh, just want somebody who was of faith. She needs a man of faith. Mm. You know, so when we're talking about wants and needs, wants, like you say, wants is something that, yeah, I could want it, but it's something that, hey, I could possibly live without as well. You know, But your needs are something that I think are just non-negotiables those things that um, are intrinsic to what makes you you and what you actually uh, have to have reciprocated from a part. Yes. And since this is the second time Love is Blind came up on this podcast, (laughs) well, I I forget if the episode has not been put out yet or not. Um, This is still the second time (laughs) within recording (laughs) history. This, that show has come up on this show. Y'all better write me that check (laughs) or hire me as a relationship coach because I can get these people right. That's all I know. And that's that. But look, write that check but um, yeah. but I, I i agree with you completely like most definitely with that situation because that is w- within her value something that she just could not overcome which mm-hmm. is fine and um yeah she was trying to work it out she was I, I would say she was doing it in honest faith not necessarily just to be on the show but she really did want to work things out because she did give him back the ring. She mm-hmm. did tell him up front that this is something that I don't think that I can do. Um, but we, I'm willing to give this an honest effort. And after meeting uh, her, the family, um, it was just like, no, it, it just can't, it just cannot be a thing. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, you know, and I think that for people trying to assess, you know, um, your wants and your needs, you really just do have to be honest with yourself. You know, somebody said one time, you can't wake somebody who wants to stay asleep, mm. you know? So it's not up to you to, you know, uh, always in, be in a space where you're trying to teach a significant other how to be woke, you know? And like something that, um, you know, like Amanda Seal said one time, I believe this was um, her time um, when she was um, on the talk show, The Real, like as they were having a conversation one time about their, I think their needs and their wants, you know, her being an activist and being of ad- advocacy and things like that. She was like, yeah, my need uh, in a partner is somebody who wants, you know, those things. She's like, yeah, you look good, but what are you doing to fight white supremacy? 
Like, I need to know. (laughs) Amen to that. So it's like, but, you know, when you have those intrinsic needs or those things that are, you know, or just innate in you, you need somebody. If you are an activist or, you know, something like that, if that is important to you, you need somebody who is going to be in the midst of that fight with you. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you are somebody who is a religious person, you know, you can't compromise, um, you know, your values for somebody who is just not, you know, you can be a part of, and like many people have said, they don't really care about really what, you know, I did a sector or affiliation of religion that, you know, somebody has, but to have somebody who is religious be paired with somebody who just isn't, I don't know how well that's going to work. Right. I know even, even for myself, I know like, uh, I'm, I'm a, huge advocate for trans rights and mm-hmm. i know i i cannot date somebody who is uh a transphobe because first and foremost i have multiple trans friends and if mm-hmm. i cannot bring you like uh, you know most people like if i can't bring around family my mm-hmm. friends are my family friends so are if right. i cannot bring you around them then you cannot be in my life uh if you're if that's something that you you cannot work on that's fine i accept that you do you and find the partner that is best for you but i know what's best for me same yeah. thing when it comes to reparations like if you if you just like oh no black people don't deserve that who the mm-hmm. ones who built this country <laughs> the ones who still making this country successful no <laughs> we can't do that like it's certain things that not even based off like you know political things or even uh, political views but if you don't know exactly what it is that you need in a relationship, then I will, I will argue not to engage or even try to go down that route, figure Mm. out who, who it is that you are, what it is that you want to see on a regular basis in your life, figure out how, uh, what you feel as though will lead to more self-discovery, self-development in your own personal success and then go out there and find what suits those needs for you, where you can have a partner that is going to uplift you as much as you uplift them, rather than you sitting at the bottom and they continue to rise or they're at the bottom and you, and you continue to rise. Right. And it's also important to know that, you know, what you want uh, in life can obviously change, you know, mm-hmm. um, I think many times when we're trying to vet or be in, you know, relationships we're so distracted by what it is that we want that we forget about uh, what does our per- what does our partners want, and so mm. it's important for us to remember that you know your partner doesn't walk the same path just because you share the same vision, but it's all about how do you make those paths come together. Amen. So that way you're making sure that you're growing together. I think a lot of times because of the fact we live in a society where we live for instant gratification, it's like, oh, if you don't see things my way, it's over. Right. You know, or you're not looking on the same trajectory of me, it's over. But instead of having that kind of mindset, try to understand about what their path or their trajectory does look like. And does your path and your trajectory kind of at some point meet that? You know, Mm -hmm. so when, you know, you're trying to get things that you need to know about a person, ask what they need and how can you actually accomplish that together? Mm. Amen to that. Amen. So I feel like that is a great transition over to, you know, towards the end of the show, unfortunately, (laughs) Um, (laughs) we'll be discussing a little bit of my, my favorite little things, my never have I ever shit. Are you ready? Good, sir. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> Ooh, never have I ever given or received a hand job in a public place. Oh, I have. Mm. Where was this place? Um, it was. Well, I mean, it wasn't too too public, but it was like parked in a car, like parked in a car, like on the side, like on the side of the road. That counts. Uh, I <laughs> I definitely um, I had a hand job in public, like in a parking lot. Also, um, um, there was a mutual situation that happened at a park uh, after dark. Nobody was there, but we were definitely out in the open. Um, if you pulled up, <clears throat> you would have noticed. No, uh, like most of you had like a light, but um, yeah, um, done that. I need. This is, I do not do public play anymore. Um, not at all. 
can go to jail. That's because people don't be knowing how to cruise no more. Like people, like they just people just ruin everything. I agree. I I blame the internet. (laughs) Like I will, I will say that like there's a space and time for everything. It's just. The way people do it these days, there's no sense of security. There's no idea of making sure, like, I get the aspect of someone might walk up on you, but you should not be putting yourself in a space where someone can walk up on you yeah. because then you're going to jail or you're going to get fined or something negative is going to happen if you're caught. And then because of word of mouth that happens and people can't keep their mouths closed on social media and things like that, like particularly for those who any, you know, listeners who are from the Atlanta area, you know, of a particular park that I may be referring that Mm -hmm. I may be referring to very cryptically uh, that has now installed, um, you know, like uh, detectors and cameras and, you know, things like that, because you know, of cruising that, you know, tends to happen. And so it's like, that has never been done before, you know, never been done before. And, you know, it's just like a lot of people just ruin things for a lot of people. Right. And I'm all for like, this, this is my, cause you know, I'm big on sexual health and, you know, sexuality and sexual expression all together. (laughs) Why is it that we cannot just have a state funded park where you could just cruise around and, you know, you have, you have to swipe in with your ID. So everybody knows you're in here, you're above 18 and you're about to be a hoe. Which is, you? I mean, but I mean, but that's a good point because it's like there are certain places that they are openly known to be new beaches, right? So it's kind of like you know, if you're going to this particular beach, you are going to probably see people who are nude, and it's not a problem. Mm-hmm. But we cannot have sex at a park. Exactly. Like, <laughs> what the hell? like what the hell? Like it, like it's it's so it's so simple. Like I need to be like mayor of somebody's city uh like it's so simple to control this to make sure that no one underage has access to it um make sure that it's not something that everyone knows about in a sense as Mm -hmm. the people who are involved in this activity that's involved in this community are consenting to be here they are consenting adults engaging in adult play in a consensual manner and they're just having fun and not offending any other individuals, they're not, you cannot readily see them having sex out in the open because we have enough trees to prevent that. You might end up seeing a deer somewhere because this is fucking Georgia, but that's it. (laughs) Don't fuck the deer. We don't, we do not condone bestiality, but look, it is ways to do this without always having to demonize sexual yeah. experiences and exactly. we don't take that route to figure how figure out how to do that think about how much money that will be like entrance into the park is five dollars do you yeah. know how many people love to have public sex or dreamed about yeah. having public sex or just want to watch people have public sex or be the actor of catching somebody while having let me get paid yeah. to be a karen yeah. in that situation i will love it <laughs> like Look, just put a stamp on it, like new parts, make it a thing. Make it a thing. Make it a thing. If y'all need help, whoever hears this that's a public official, if y'all need help (laughs) with getting this figured out, hire me. I got you. (laughs) Logistics is my thing. Exactly. All right. So would you like a sex question? Sure. So, uh, ooh, this is cute. Talk me through your perfect kiss. Perfect kiss. Um, my perfect kiss is something that starts off um, really light and intense in, intensifies as the kisses become more passionate because I'm much more of a slow and sensual person. Mm. So like a perfect kiss is something that starts off kind of light. It's kind of like a tease. Um, and then it becomes it becomes a little bit more passionate. There's like a little licking of the the bottom and top lip you know if we're getting into the nature of using a little bit of tongue you know I don't like you know necessarily like aggressive aggression you know like a full-out aggression especially like if it's like a first kiss or you know something like that where you know somebody's just trying to stick their tongue down your mouth and stuff like Mm -hmm. that like that's really unappealing um so yeah something that is teased and then it slowly gets a little it gets more um passionate and intimate as it continues to happen I just imagine that kiss in like a, a scene 
that would be a wonderful kid. It's like, you need to be a screenwriter too. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like the perfect chance. Well, let me get one of those. Be, it may be coming one of these days. Look, let me get one of those for $5.99. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the menu. Um, let's see, for myself... I, I I do also like to start things off slow and build out the process. But for me, I wouldn't want to focus the kiss so much on the lips at first. Ooh, I want it to transition into kind of an ear nibbling situation because Ooh. that's the thing that really gets me going. <laughs> uh, and just the transition between that soft kiss up into a little bit of biting and then Ooh. getting to the nibble. Mm. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would that be four, the look, that foreplay is like heaven. And sometimes that's all that you need. That's all you need. <laughs> that's how you get like, into I the... am squared away. Look, we good. We good. Yeah, I'll call you tomorrow. <laughs> See you a text message. Good morning. How are you doing? Do you need anything? You good? You healthy? What are your <laughs> needs? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You did something right last night. Um so on that note, uh, are there any tips that you would like to uh, leave with the audience? Oh, Jess, um, I think as going back to thinking about preferences and thinking about social emotional intelligence and just all the all of those great topics that you know have have been discussed, just to uh, remind you know all the listeners that as you are looking for potential partners or looking to date for something serious, what have you, just to always remember to be, as you mentioned earlier, be intentional about what it is that you're, that you're looking for and that you're doing. So that way you can actually manifest um, positive energy to come into your life. So that way you're not dealing with, you're not dealing with bums out here, you know? (laughs) Yes. Yes. Manifest, manifest. Manifest. (laughs) <laughs> well thank you so much for being a part of the podcast rl i really appreciate you you are amazing thank um, you so much. <laughs> now to the audience thank you all so much for listening to the holiloquy podcast where we step out and talk about sexuality and just in case no one else told you this today you are beautiful you are worthy of happiness and joy you are enough and then some you may not live up to the expectations of others but that is okay You are only required to walk in your own shoes. May each day you live lead you towards abundance. With that said, love you all and see you next episode. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the Holiloquy Podcast, where we step out and speak on sexuality. You can subscribe to the podcast through your favorite podcasting app and find us on the web at www.holiloquy.com. That's www.h-e-a-u-x. L-I-L-O-Q-U-Y dot com. Share the podcast with your friends and join the conversation.